Okay, this is going to be the first of a three-part series in pharmacokinetics, and up here I have listed basically what I'm going to cover in this series, liberation of a drug, absorption of a drug, distribution, and elimination. Within pharmacology, there are two big groups of study. The first group is pharmacokinetics, and the second is pharmacodynamics. These are the two areas that most medical students are responsible for knowing, and the basic difference between the two, pharmacodynamics answers the question, what does this drug do to my body? This is what most medical students are interested in. However, equally important is, what does my body do to the drug? Now I've written down here, pharmacodynamics, the drug can have activity at almost any point within the pharmacokinetic outline. So in pharmacokinetics, we administer a drug. The drug is liberated somewhere in our body and we absorb it. As we absorb it, it gets distributed. It gets distributed and then it gets eliminated. It can be eliminated at almost any point and it can also take activity at almost any point. Sometimes those activities are desired and sometimes they're not desired. So first, there are several routes of administration. I'm just going to quickly go over a few of these and highlight some high yield things. But there are, there's a lot more to know about this. So you can take something orally, you can have something intravenously, you can have it uh, intramuscularly injected. You can put nitroglycerin under your tongue and absorb it. You can take things parenterally, meaning that's the IV administration. With each of these routes of delivery, there are different things you have to be aware of. For example, if you take something orally, you have a very high acid content in your stomach and can destroy many different kinds of drugs. For example, omeprazole is destroyed by stomach acid, and so it's covered by an enteric coating. If you have a pill that has a, a coating on the outside, then it is very likely that coating is protecting it from your stomach acid. In those kinds of situations, you do not want to cut the pill in half, break it open, or anything like that, or else it's going to be destroyed. You're not going to have any effect from the medication. On the other hand, there are medicines that have scoring on them, and the scoring is basically, you won't see a medicine with scoring on it unless, if it, if it is uh, disrupted by stomach acid. The scoring on a medicine is basically to tell you, if you want to take half of this medicine, this is where you break it. On the other hand, there are some medications that actually will hurt your stomach. For example, I've written down aspirin, acetosalicylic acid. Acetosalicylic acid or aspirin can actually cause ulcers, and so they put an enteric coating over that so that it doesn't get any interactivity with your stomach. It gets broken down in the intestine. There are also things called extended release. Sometimes you'll have a capsule, so I'll draw a long capsule and it can be opened up or whatever, and inside those capsules there will be a whole bunch of tiny little beads or, or um, balls inside of it, and if you break that open you can see those things, but the thing is each one of those capsules is, is uh, something a little bit different um, binder, a little bit different makeup, or a little bit different coating around it so that each one of those capsules will break apart at a different rate. Some of them might be thicker so that it takes a longer time for them to be uh, chewed up by your stomach acid or your enzymes. Some of them are designed so that they open up at a different pH. So while some of them may start to become opening while they're inside your stomach acid, others will start to open as they enter the duodenum and further on down your digestive tract. This allows an extended release, uh, so if you have a medication that you need to get a little bit, but you need to get it all the way throughout the day. So you need to take, if, if you were to take it in, in that same interval, you would be taking maybe like one or two milligrams every hour, and so you'd have to take a pill every hour. To keep you from having to do that, that's what the extended release things are made for. Some drugs are inhaled. And some drugs are for, like, example, for asthma or for anesthetics during, uh, during surgery. You'll know that some medications are nasal sprays. You can just snort them up your nose. And some of that will get into the larger airway, the pharynx, or whatever. But most of that will stay inside the nasal and the sinuses. Uh, you have intrathecal, which means inside of, the, inside of the cerebral spinal fluid. So some ways of doing that is you can actually inject stuff into the, um, into the spinal area. You can also create an omaya reservoir. So if you have this is somebody's head, and then there's their skull, and inside their skull is 
is their brain, and inside the brain is their ventricles. And there's a surgery where you can put a reservoir, uh, a little pipe, a little tube that goes right into the ventricles. And that is one way of delivering things like chemotherapy for brain cancers. It's an, also a way to deliver uh, antimicrobials if you have a, a case of of somebody who ha who is immunosuppressed and got cryptococcal meningitis, for example. It's not going to always be done for every type of CNS uh, uh, indication, but it's going to depend on a patient-by-patient -patient case. Topical administration of uh, pharmacology, this is a, a subject almost all into itself with pharmacokinetics. I won't be going into it completely, but I will say I will point out a few high-yield things. It's like you can put antifungals, you can put antibacterials on your skin, like bacitrace and polymyxin. You can put uh, cortico uh, cortisone cream, so if you have a rash. Another thing is I get poison ivy uh, if I'm around it. And one thing I love is topical lidocaine. You can do transdermal, so this is like if you have a patch of something, for example, they do fentanyl patches where you put the opiates directly into your body through your skin, or you can do um, you can do nicotine patches to help you quit smoking. And basically the way these work is you, you put the drug inside of a chemical that will carry it through your water impermeable skin. So your, water, your skin is very, very impermeable. That is, keeps out infections, it keeps out any type of thing that gets on you. So you have to have special chemicals to carry it in. One of those is called DMSO. I have uh, actually seen a couple of things. So I don't know whether to be disturbed or not, but people using DMSO for their own homemade tinctures. So that's something that happens and you have to be aware of. There's also rectal administration of some drugs. So sometimes people are vomiting way too much. So you can't even give them something entirely. You can't give them something orally. So you have to give it to them rectally. And this is done with a lot of antiemetics. Well, not, I wouldn't say a lot, but it's done oftentimes more so than with other things when you're using antiemetics. And another thing you have to be um, aware of and cognizant of is that if you do rectal administration, 50% of the blood flow in this area is going to bypass First, first pass metabolism. I'll talk a little bit more what that all means. But first pass metabolism basically means that most of the blood flow from your stomach and from your intestines is going to go straight to your liver. So this is my liver. If all, almost most of my blood flow is going into here, and the liver's job is to detoxify the body. And so if the if you're taking all of your blood into there, it's going to see those medications, it's going to do its best to detoxify, to turn off the medication. And so out of, if you give a 200 milligram dose of a medication, your body might only see 50 milligrams of it. And so all of that's calculated into the dosing, but you have to be aware that you're going to have a larger systemic dose if you're bypassing that first pass metabolism. Some medications have to be liberated. For example, I'll give you uh, one example is Vyvanse. So Vyvanse is sort of like Adderall. It's a stimulant. The difference is this. Let's say I have this, this medication is, is Adderall, and, and I see that people are abusing it. I see that people are crushing it up and they're snorting it, or they're, they're doing different things to, to use it as a recreational drug, and I don't want that to happen, so I'm a pharmacologist, and I, and I add on this this amino acid lysine. So lysine is tacked onto that stimulant and now if it's snorted or whatever it's not going to be absorbed into the body. It will not be taken up into the body if it's snorted or taken through any other route. The only way that you're going to get this lysine off of here is if you put it in a high stomach acid pH. So the pH is really low, stomach acid is really high and it's going to cause that to break right off free up that stimulant and then it can be absorbed and therefore it has to be swallowed. It can't be taken another route. So after a drug is liberated, the mechanism of absorption is going to be different by whatever route you've taken it. And so for example, the example I've given you is that of Vyvanse, it will not be absorbed at all if it's not taken by the, right, the correct route. The mechanism of absorption is going to be, in general, the same as everything you've learned in your biology and physiology classes. You have diffusion, which is passive or facilitated. You have active transport, transcytosis. These things are all things that you know. So let's talk a couple of high yields on one in particular, which is diffusion. First of all, diffusion is concentration dependent. So the higher your concentration is, the faster your diffusion rate will be. Secondly, diffusion is going to be limited 
on how much of a charge the, the uh, chemical holds. So you'll think of, for example, if you have something that is an anion, negative charge, you cannot absorb something that has a charge very easily via diffusion. You can by other transport, active or transitosis, but just by diffusion alone, if something has a charge, you're not absorbing it across a, a membrane, across a cell membrane. And so one thing you can do to alter that is you can change the pH. So if something is, uh, you know, has a hydrogen ion laying around and it's negatively charged, that hydrogen ion can attach to it, it can form a neutral, a neutral chemical, and then it can be absorbed. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Let's suppose we are in the, in the digestive system, in the stomach at this point, and then here's my blood. And so if I have something that has a low pKa, low pKa, and now you don't really need to go back and think about what pKa is per se back in your, um, your general chemistry courses, but you do know that things that have a, a low pKa are typically carboxylic acids or have carboxylic acid residues on them. So you'll remember that that's a C bound to an OH that has a double bond to an O. And you'll, you'll remember that this, uh, this double bond allows for resonance and it allows this hydrogen ion to leave so that it can, it can basically be a CO negative double bound to an O. And so things in general with a low pKa, if you have a, if you have a high pH, they will be charged. So I've written that right here. I've put that if it's a low pKa, a high pH will cause it to be charged, and that means it will be trapped. So for example, if you take something that has a low pKa, and this is your stomach, it will, be, it will not be charged. It will be in the HA form, and it will move freely into the blood. The blood has a, a higher pH, so as soon as it moves into the blood, it will, it will lose its proton, and it will form into the A-, and that will keep the concentration gradient favoring the moving into the blood from the stomach. Otherwise, if it gets into the duodenum, where the pH is much higher, it will, it will be in the charged form, and it will not move into the blood as easily. Now we've talked about things with low pKa's, things with high pKa's now. Something with a high pKa tends to be something that is bound to NH2. And actually, let me draw that a little bit different. So if I have my nitrogen here, I'll have, I'll have a hydrogen up here, I'll have a hydrogen right here, and I'll have a, a lone pair right here. This lone pair of electrons, right here in this state where it's at, this lone pair of electrons and these two hydrogens, it's in a neutral state and it's easily absorbed. But if another hydrogen gets added on and takes advantage of those two extra electrons, it will become in a charged state. So to summarize this, if your pH is low and your pKa is also low, you'll be in an uncharged form. If your pH is low and your pKa is high, you'll be charged form. Vice versa, if your pH is high and the pKa is low, it'll be charged. It's the carboxylic acid group being deprotonated in the high pH. And on the other hand, if you have a high pKa, in moving into the high pH, you will lose that positively charged proton, making it neutral, uncharged. And just as a reminder, what is pKa? pKa tells you what is the pH when I have an equal number of things that are protonated and unprotonated. So when the pH is equal to the pKa, half of your molecules will be charged and half will be uncharged. Now, if you remember, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, way back from general chemistry, tells us that we can calculate the pH. The pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of whatever concentration I have in the, in the basic form over the concentration I have in the acidic form. In other words, the deprotonated versus the protonated. Now look what we can do. We can actually change this equation up. We can subtract the pKa to the other side of the equation. And when we do that, we see that the pH minus the pKa is going to give us the log base 10 of the unprotonated form over the protonated form. Now it's time to interpret that because typically we know what the pH is at various parts of our body and we know what the pKa of various substances are. So what does that tell us if we, if we are looking at it in these terms? It tells us if we have the 
pH minus the pKa equal to zero, that means that the pH equals the pKa, and that means that the, that the log of this, the log of A minus over HA, is going to be equal to each other. That means that if I had 10 A minuses, I would have also, I would have also 10 protonated, 10 unprotonated, 10 protonated. And so what if it wasn't zero? What if it equaled one? Well, if it equaled one, then that would mean that our, we have ten times more unprotonated than protonated. If it equaled two, that would mean we have a hundred times more protonated versus unprotonated. Likewise, we can go the other direction. If it was negative one, it would mean that our unprotonated was one-tenth of our protonated, or our protonated form is ten times higher. And also, with negative 2, it is the protonated form is 100 times higher. Now, I want to give you a word of warning. I plugged in numbers, a 10 and a 1. Now, having the pH minus the pKa, minus the pKa equal to 1 does not mean that your numbers are going to be 10 and 1. It just means that whatever the top number is, the bottom number is 1 tenth of that. Whatever the bottom number is, the top number will be 10 times higher. So the bottom number could have been a 2 and the top number would have end up being a 20. Knowing what this number is right here does not tell us what the concentration of anything is. It just tells us what the relative concentration is. Now we can do clinical application to this. So if we have a, a uh, drug that we're going to take and we know that it has a high pKa, one thing we might think about doing is taking an antacid like a Tums and it would increase the absorption of that. The other thing is whenever you're trying to get rid of something. So if you have a drug that's inside of your body already, say you've overdosed on something, you can actually trap that inside of the kidney. So you have your kidney right here and your kidney f is filtering all of your blood and if that is a a medication that is cleared by the kidney then it works in the same manner so if you have it in a charged form then it will get into the into the kidney tubule and it will go straight in to the uh, collecting system and be excreted on the other hand if it's in an uncharged form it'll go into the kidney tubule and some of it will diffuse out just because it's in an uncharged form. So if you want to trap it in the kidney and keep it from being excreted, you want to keep it, keep it in a charged form. For acidic drugs, for things that have a low pKa, this is sometimes done by adding, a, if you administer a sodium bicarb, NaHCO3, then that will bring down the pH and you can actually uh, keep these things charged and keep them in the, in the kidney. On the other hand, if something has a high pKa, that means you would have to acidify the blood to keep it trapped in the kidney, that ca causing an acidosis. And so it's not done very often because doing that causes a lot of other problems. But adding a little bit of base to the blood doesn't typically cause as much problem because our, our kidneys are better at handling base than it is at handling acid. So we can use this information about pH and pKa to do both increase the absorption of the drug and to increase the excretion of the drug if it's renally cleared. On the other hand, if we want it to have a longer period of action, we can increase its retention. So if it has a high pKa and you uh, give, if somebody is taking uh, Tums on a regular basis, for example, it will increase its retention in the body. And the last thing we can do is we can actually use this information to increase its volume of distribution. I won't explain completely what volume of distribution is right now, but we'll get back into that. But what you need to know is let's say that the body is modeled in as if it had different compartments. And so this would be your blood compartment and then your extracellular tissue. You may have some adipose tissue as well. If you have something that is charged, it will not move into the adipose tissue as well. But if it is neutral, you can get it to move into the, the fatty tissue. So if you have a drug that is trapped in one, in one area and it would be less toxic if it were moved to another area, you can change the pH to allow the drug to have a larger volume of distribution. With that larger volume of distribution, it makes it less toxic. This is something you would consider if you had a drug that is that is completely reabsorbed by the kidney. Let's say that you have a drug that's filtered into the kidney, but the kidney reabsorbs all of it. So it does not matter how, whether it's charged or uncharged, you're not going to excrete it in your kidney until your liver metabolizes it. And so in this case, increasing its volume of distribution will help it to become less toxic. 
okay, quickly, what else can alter the absorption? If it, something is taken enterally and it's... Uh, if it's absorbed via diffusion, then of course the pH of the GI tract and the pKa of the drug, the contact surface area, whether you're absorbing it primarily from the stomach, which has a low surface area, or the intestines, which has a larger surface area, the contact time, how fast is your stomach moving? Is your stomach hyperactive? Do you need to take something to slow down your stomach's activity? If your blood flow is altered, it can alter the absorption. The number of transporters, this is for specific drugs that are not diffusion per se, but the number of transporters can interact and have a, an effect on how fast something is absorbed. And there are many, many other things. I'm not going to get into all of them. You just need to know that absorption can be altered. When it's altered, you need to understand and know about it so that you can plan ahead for that. Once you absorb a drug, that's when it starts having its activity. What you need to know is that as it has its activity, as it's being distributed throughout your body, its concentration is what's going to determine its effect. Most drugs, not mo many drugs, interact with some kind of enzyme or some kind of receptor. And because they interact with an enzyme or receptor, their activity can be, can be uh, mapped as a, a Michaelis-Mitten curve. So you remember in your biochemistry, Michaelis-Mitten enzyme kinetics, you get some sort of uh, maximum velocity at that enzyme. If you have the uh, maximum velocity, that means your drug concentration is as high as it could be. Getting it any higher would not have any activity. So you just need to keep these things in mind. Your, your drug concentration is what's going to determine its effect. If your volume of distribution is very high, if it goes to not just your bloodstream, but if it goes into the extracellular fluid, and then it goes into the intracellular fluid, which would be total body water, if it moves into adipose tissue, into fat, and is trapped there, you need to know these things because that will alter its concentration. The higher the volume, the lower the concentration. The other thing that determines concentration inside the body is how fast it's eliminated. So the desired concentration, it's a balance between how fast it's being brought in versus how fast it's being taken out. Now how fast a drug is taken out of your body is almost always going to be concentration dependent. So if you have a low concentration of a drug, it's going to move out very slow. And as the concentration of the drug gets higher, it's going to start moving out faster and faster. And this means that eventually, as you increase your dose, eventually the elimination is going to match the, what is brought in. So what is brought in will match what is taken out so that at that point, the concentration remains steady. And so as long as you are administering the exact same amount and you're administering it at the exact same intervals, then eventually you will get to a concentration where what is being brought in matches what is being taken out. What I mean by that is you'll come to this steady state concentration. In talking about steady state concentration, what is being brought in, absorption, you have to understand the concept of bioavailability. If I give somebody a dose of a drug by intravenous injection or by IV, then 100% of that drug is available inside of the body. I don't have to worry about any type of absorption interfering with that. On the other hand, if I were to give the same dose enterally, the amount that is available will be less than 100%. And so we have this concept called the bioavailable fraction, and that is the ratio of the drug that is available systemically when I take it by some other method than intravenous. And that's a simple formula. So it's the drug available via enteral administration divided by the drug available via IV administration. So let me first explain this graph. Whenever I give a drug, IV, so if I give, let's say, 100 um, milligrams of a drug, I give it all over a really quick period of time intravenously. Let's say I give it all, push it all within two minutes, so all of it's available to the entire body all at the same time. At the very second that I give that drug, IV, it's going to really quickly distribute to all of the tissue, and after it's done distributing, your body will slowly start eliminating it. So this, is, this line represents the body eliminating that drug. 
one thing you should know about this line is it's the it's the graph of the natural log of the concentration. So over here, I have the natural log of the concentration. And the reason I say it's the natural log of the concentration is because uh, this follows first order kinetics, and first order kinetics makes a straight line when it's graphed as the natural log. Okay, I'll explain all of that in a minute, but what you should really look at and think about is this area underneath the curve. So if I look at this area right here, this area represents the area under the curve for the, uh, for the plasma concentration when given IV. And then if we look at just this area right here, this is the area under the curve. If I give the same medication entirely, if I give it as a pill, I'm giving the same amount, so I said, let's say I, I gave 10 milligrams IV, I'm also going to give at the same time 10 milligrams as a pill, so uh, IV and pill. And then you measure the plasma concentration of each of these over uh, many different times, and you will get a graph like this. And the bioavailability is defined as the area under the curve entirely divided by the area under the curve for the, uh, for the um, injection. Usually this bioavailable fraction is labeled as an F. And just again, I'll explain this enteral area under the curve. So when I first take it, I don't have any medicine in my system. And it's slowly being absorbed until I get to the peak concentration. After I get to the peak concentration, the only thing that's happening is elimination from my body. So yes, some of it is being eliminated as I get closer to the peak concentration, but it's being eliminated slower than it's accumulating until it finally gets here and then it is, being, it is fully absorbed and it is being eliminated. And so two things that you need to be aware of is the concept of peak concentration with an intravenous thing. Peak concentration happens at the moment that the injection happens. With, uh, with enteral, then it takes time to reach the peak concentration. So this is the peak concentration at this concentration right here, and this is the time to reach peak concentration. Because bioavailability is altered by the absorption, is altered by the pH, we talked about the blood flow, the contact area, and it's, it's altered by time. And the other thing it's altered by is first pass metabolism, and we'll talk about more of that later. But the effect of the drug, most of the effect of any drug, is going to be dictated by its peak concentration and its time to peak concentration. These are what's going to affect how the drug acts inside of us. These are the things that are going to determine the pharmacodynamics of the drug. If you're taking an ibuprofen for a toothache and it takes 10 hours to get to peak concentration, you're not going to have relief from your, from your pain for 10 hours, then you wouldn't take that as a medication. It would be useless. There's also some terminology that you'll encounter in pharmacology textbooks you might want to be familiar with. It's not super high yield in my opinion, um, except when you're describing or comparing two different medications. So if you have to compare two different medications, this is when this becomes important. The, the terminology is something called pharmaceutical equivalence. So pharmaceutical equivalence means you use the same ingredient, it's taken the same way, so you have this drug, let's say it's ibuprofen is the drug, it's the active ingredient. So you have two pills, ibuprofen, they're both taken entirely, and they have the same strength. So these are both two different companies, both making 200 milligram ibuprofen. Oh, the difference here is we have this one that's a red pill, and we have this other one that's a blue pill. So they do not have to have the same flavor, they do not have to have the same color, they do not have to have the same shape or scoring. What they do have to have is the same active ingredient in the same concentration. Now, therapeutic equivalence goes a step further because let me just first tell you that this red pill over here, it has a binder in it that holds on to it tighter and therefore it's not released as easily in the stomach and in the intestine. But this blue pill is released very readily. And so whenever we talk about therapeutic equivalence, that means that the pills, that the medication is pharmaceutically equivalent and it has the same clinical effect. So in that situation, you can see how my pharmaceutically equivalent medications are not therapeutically equivalent. However, if I were to take a larger dose of the red pill, it would have the same effect. So let's go on and talk about bioequivalence. Bioequivalence is, it has the same bioavailability and it has the same peak, uh, time to peak concentration. 
In that situation, you could see that a bioequivalent would be this medication and this medication. They are bioequivalent because even though this is a larger dose, it ends up having the same peak concentration and the same time to peak concentration. And so in that situation, therapeutically equivalent, all therapeutically equivalent drugs would end up would also be bioequivalent, but there would be some things that are bioequivalent that are not therapeutically equivalent. So in summary, pharmaceutically equivalent is the same active ingredient, strength, and route of administration. Therapeutic equivalent is all of these things plus the same effect. And then bioequivalence is the bioavailability and, and time to peak concentration. Bioavailability and peak concentration, these are the two things that determine the effect. So when you're talking about what the drug does, what is its overall effect, you want to know the bioequivalence. Next thing we're going to talk about is distribution. Whenever things are in the body, once they've absorbed, they will distribute to different parts of the body. And we try to think of this as compartments or cups. So this is the cup of, of what would be your blood or plasma. And sitting right next to that, touching it, would be a cup that we call the extracellular fluid. And then next to that is intracellular fluid. This uh, size is not meant to represent anything except that I ran out of space there. And you can see that once something gets absorbed, it's going to be in the blood. And if it's a large molecule and it's, it, has, it requires active transport to get absorbed, then it's going to remain in the blood. But if it's small enough, then once it's in the blood, it can distribute out and it can fill up this extracellular fluid. And it can fill up that entire volume of space as well. And if it's, um, if it, if it's able to move across the cellular membrane, then it can move in and take up this intracellular fluid as well. What if, though, the drug is not water-soluble in it? If it's not water-soluble, then once it gets into the blood, it will be bound to a molecule called albumin. Albumin will carry it, and it will only be able to move through the blood when it's carried on albumin. But what it can do is that it can move into lipids, and it can fill up almost any space that is lipid, which would be all the membrane area, all these membrane area. And it would not distribute into it would not distribute into the extracellular fluid. It would not distribute into the intracellular fluid, but it would distribute into things that are lipids. So adipocytes have lots of lipids. It would be accumulated in that lipid area. So these are things that we call volume of distribution. Volume of distribution is kind of like two things at the same time. The first thing is what is the overall volume that something is distributed, that the medication is distributed into? Is it all of the lipid volume? Is it all of the albumin volume? And the other thing that it describes is this theoretical volume. Why, why do I say it's a theoretical volume? Well, first of all, if it is liquid soluble, if it's water soluble and it's distributing equally through um, any of the water spaces, then the volume of distribution will equal... Well, before I tell you what it equals, let's just talk really quick. If I have a certain mass of drug, and I have it in a, in a certain volume of space, then this calculation right here is called the concentration. This is equal to the drug concentration. So if I were to, to rearrange this so that the volume was being solved for, then the volume of distribution is equal to the, the mass of the drug divided by the drug's concentration. And so whenever we take a blood sample, we take a certain blood sample and we measure the concentration of the drug, then we know, and we also we know what the mass of the drug, we know that we gave you know, 200 milligrams, for example, IV. We gave IV 200 milligrams. And we, we can measure the concentration. And by that, we can say, okay, this, ha this is distributed to, you know, well, let's say 5 liters. So this is distributed to all of the blood. Or let's say it's distributed to all the blood plus all of the extracellular fluid. Then that, this equation is going to tell us exactly the volume that it is in. And that, so in that case, the volume of distribution is not some theoretical thing. It is the real volume that it's distributed to. But on the other hand, let's imagine a different situation. Let's imagine a situation where we have all of the, uh, all of the medication coming in and binding to albumin. 
And then once it comes to an adipocyte, so this is all of my, my fat cells over here, it gets sequestered into these adipocytes. So high, high, high concentration in this adipocyte, but very low concentration in the blood. If we come and measure this blood, we'll see that the concentration is very low. And we use, we know we gave, you know, 200 milligrams, and we know that the concentration is, is 2, so it looks like the volume of distribution is 100, let's say 100 liters. Well, we don't have a volume of 100 liters of any type of fluid in our body. In fact, based on the Watson formula, somebody my age and my height should have a total body water of about 45 and a half liters. So in this case, the volume of distribution is a theoretical volume, and it's used mostly just to be able to describe the blood or plasma concentration of the drug. Within distribution, there are two things you have to keep in mind. The first is the volume of distribution. The second is the time of distribution. The higher the volume, it will take, it'll cause it to take more time. Low blood flow will cause it to take more time. And then there are other things that can interfere, like binding proteins and co partition coefficients, depending on the nature of the drug. So if you were to give a drug intravenously, it starts out at a peak concentration right here, and then it drops really rapidly down to this point, and then it follows a straight path down as it's being eliminated. This time period right here, where it's dropping rapidly, that's called the distribution phase. So the drug is, is not being eliminated right there, it's being distributed to all of its areas where it needs to be, and then at that point, everything where it's dropping after that is called the elimination. Well, it was being eliminated at this point, but we don't know uh, we don't know per se how much was eliminated. So what we can do is we can draw a line backwards and we can say, okay, that was actually my my um, original concentration right there. So we know it was it was being eliminated at a constant rate, and so that was the original concentration by following that line backwards. So here I've put, you know, we have the distribution phase, we have the elimination phase. And we can find the original concentration. So we suppose we were to take the, uh, the blood right here and measure it. Well, it's going to show that the concentration is really, really high. But if, it, it was, if the moment we gave it, it was completely distributed to all of its areas and places where it needed to be, then its concentration would really have been right there. And so I've put the concentration at time zero is found by following that line backwards. And then we can say that the volume of distribution is the dose given. The dose is always in some form of mass, whether that would be um, grams, milligrams, moles. It's mass divided by its concentration gives you the volume. And then you could do dimensional analysis. Mass divided by mass over volume is going to equal mass over uh, mass times volume over mass. That cancels out. That gives you volume. That's volume of distribution. Okay, so far we've talked about administration, liberation, absorption, and distribution. Over the next couple of videos, it's going to be all about elimination. And during that time, we'll talk about concentration, steady state, and things that you have to understand elimination to really have a good grasp of.